So hello everyone, my name is Brett Steele and I am the Senior Director for Preventing Targeted Violence at the McCain Institute for International Leadership. Thank you for joining us for our ninth workshop for the Emerging Prevention Practitioners Network. For this workshop, we will be discussing the threat of and promising practices to prevent mis, dis, and mal information. The Prevention Practitioners Network, for those of you who are new to us, will be a national network of interdisciplinary professionals who are dedicated to preventing targeted violence, terrorism, and their impacts within the United States. We are currently seeking your guidance on how to shape this emerging Prevention Practitioners Network. So we'll ask you to fill out a brief survey and sign up for working groups if you're interested. If you've filled out the survey already, you do not need to fill it out again, but Addie's gonna go ahead and put the link in the chat box for those who haven't had a chance to fill it out already. More information on how to join this professional network will be communicated to you in the upcoming months. We are very excited to host our uh, first virtual fall symposium, um, which is more uh, conversation oriented than uh, just the pure content delivery that we've done in these workshops. Those dates are December 7th and 8th. And we'll be following up with more information on that soon as well. For today's workshop, we have a fantastic um, two panels of experts prepared to discuss the threat landscape on the first panel, promising practices on the second uh, for addressing mis, dis, and mal information. Each panelist will discuss this topic for about seven minutes before we open the floor to the audience for questions. We invite uh, you, our audience, um, to be very engaged in this discussion. Um, we have allowed a lot of time for questions and really welcome uh, you to either put your questions in the chat or for longer questions, I may call on you and ask you to voice your question to the audience if you're comfortable with that. Um, and we do encourage you once we get to that Q&A to turn your cameras and videos on. All right, at the end of today's discussion, we will ask you to participate in a brief uh, survey and actually we're gonna do it at the beginning as well. Um, this is a pre and post survey, this uh, grant, from the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships is being evaluated by the Research Triangle Institute. And so we collect these pre and post uh, questions to facilitate that evaluation. Um, ultimately, these workshops are put on to benefit you, prevention and intervention professionals. We want to know how we can best uh, serve you. So please do feel free to contact us with any suggestions on how we can improve our future workshops. Addie Fairley will drop her email in the chat uh, and she is the best person uh, to receive that input um, because she is what makes this whole workshop series and network itself run. All right, lastly, I want to thank our steering committee um, who have helped us make this event and all of the eight workshops before it possible, as well as the Institute for Strategic Dialogue who have done just phenomenal read ahead materials for this workshop, as well as all of our prior workshops. Um, and as I mentioned, this uh, emerging network is funded by a grant from the DHS Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, and we're delighted to feature some of their grantees in our conversation today. All right, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first um, panel. Our first panel, as I mentioned, is on the threat of mis, dis, and mal information. And we have a very full panel for you here today. Um, so uh, our panelists include um, Saran O'Connor from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, Travis Trammell, uh, PhD uh, out of Stanford University, Jared Holt from the Atlantic Council, and finally, um, 
Rachel Brown from Project Over Zero. And we're gonna go ahead and go in that order. So without further ado, Jared. Hi, good morning and good afternoon, guys. Yeah, uh, Kieran O'Connor, it's a very Irish name. Um, I'm a digital uh, an analyst with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, uh, and I'm, I'm based out of Ireland, but I'm actually in London at the moment. And there's a bit of a, a bit of a social in the background, so if you hear any murmurings, uh, you can just put it down to that. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen and get started. So yeah, so today I'll be talking about the kind of nexus of misinformation, conspiracies, and violence uh, and terrorism. So over the past decades, we've seen a massive transformation in the extremist ecosystem. What were once uh, disparate small groups have transformed into large online subcultures with the ability to turn digital mobilization into offline action. With regards to the US, our research has focused on some key trends. Uh, these communities have succeeded in connecting the dots, bringing together uh, neo-Nazi groups, anti-government militias, QAnon followers, and conspiracy theorists. It's helpful uh, to think of a Venn diagram uh, when visualizing how these groups now overlap in shared political goals, using crises and, and times of, of social unrest to weaponize hate, conspiracies, and misinformation. The threat of violence comes from across a broad ideological spectrum uh, rather than one or two violent groups. And therein lies much of the challenge in monitoring and tracking this threat today. Uh, and lastly here, this points towards a shift in post-organizational terrorism and violence towards loose uh, and individual actors. When we think of the weaponization uh, of misinformation and conspiracies, uh, this shows how the threat is becoming increasingly hybridized. The boundaries between what were once more siloed fields are now much more blurred. This doesn't always happen organically either. The flames are often fanned by hostile state actors uh, and amplification of extremist messaging on social media too. What this means is that the US now houses uh, an empowered and emboldened and violent cluster of domestic extremists and hate groups. Uh, groups who turn to mis and disinformation and conspiracy theories to normalize their views and identify an other, uh, usually the state, the government as, as the enemy. And this mainstreaming has allowed uh, extremist groups to expand their sphere of influence by way of the mass proliferation of conspiracy networks, helping them to enlarge their audiences too. Um, a quick note on, on how we do this and how we approach this field, it's through a combination of in-depth ethnographic monitoring of extremist communities, crowdsourcing emerging threats and large scale data analysis. We've used this approach to, to track over 10,000 accounts on, on in mainstream and fringe platforms and produce regular reporting, both large scale and more focused or targeted, where we extrapolate these findings around themes uh, or countries or platforms. So then to zoom in a little closer with a case study, so sorry, so to zoom in a little further, to look at the shootings in Kenosha uh, in Wisconsin, um, last summer. So using this approach to analyze extremist dynamics around the shootings in Kenosha, a uh, quick primer, of course, is that on August 23rd last year, Jacob Blake, an African-American, was shot by police, triggering protests across uh, against police violence and racial injustice. The next day, uh, armed civilians and informal militias gathered in Kenosha to deter looting or violence, and there were some clashes with protesters too. Uh, this defense, as you can see in the slide here, um, of Kenosha was promoted nationally across social media uh, and misinformation about the actions of protesters was central to this uh, and the armed civilians uh, were kind of mobilized off the back of this and around Kenosha we saw a wide range of, of mainstream and fringe social media um, platforms and, and channels and accounts rapidly deployed to amplify the unrest and recruit people to militia groups. Uh, particularly right-wing, so the social media ecosystem was mobilized here. We had pro-Trump communities, QAnon, uh, right-wing media outlets, uh, and alternative media outlets were used to frame the disturbances in terms of the in terms of reference set by the militia groups to cause a uh, sympathetic audience who supports the action on the ground at a national level. And as a result, a local militia calling itself the Kenosha Guard was started by a local man, Kevin Mathewson, with the aim of defending Kenosha. 
So on August 25th, the Kenosha Guards Facebook page for local militia was set up uh, to ins and it inspired violent responses across uh, fringe and mainstream social media. Matthewson himself posted videos of the militia on the ground and then it was promoted nationally by the conspiracy website uh, Infowars run by Alex Jones. So Infowars played a really crucial role here in promoting misinfo and conspiracies about events on the ground. They framed protesters as thugs and they used the platform to encourage people to go to Kenosha. Uh, this graph here is a very simple illustration of where the Infowars piece traveled online. Despite being banned on Facebook, the article itself was shared over 300 times. The text of the piece was shared amongst far-right communities on 4chan and Telegram, and we saw individuals and communities from across the extremist uh, spectrum opportunistically coalescing around Kenosha. And then it was picked up across various militia, pro-firearm and right-wing conspiracy websites, and we observed a close interplay between local and national networks and saw the fluid nature of contemporary extremists inspired to act on misinformation, conspiracies and against uh, incitement to violence. And at all stages, it served to incite violence against protesters and encourage people to quote unquote, defend Kenosha. And then of course we know what happened later that evening, 17 year old uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, shoots and kills two during clashes between these armed civilians and protesters. And that is uh, that. So we see how it led to uh, violence on the streets. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, next, I want to welcome Travis Trammell, uh, PhD out of Stanford. Travis. Hi, thank you. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure to be joining you today. Um, I'll be presenting also a few slides uh, based on research that I did uh, in pursuit of my PhD. So I'll say up front, uh, that some of this is a little bit dated just because um, this was based uh, primarily on, like I say, pre PhD research that I conducted uh, a couple years ago, but uh, I do think it's still topical and applicable for today, so I'll dive right into it. Um, it we began this research uh, by looking, that I'm sure many of you are aware of, the, the concept of echo chambers across uh, um, different online networks and then how those echo chambers could be potentially targeted by, uh, I was really focused on nation state uh, disinformation uh, at the time when I, when I conducted the research. So basically how would a nation state attempt to exacerbate polarization, uh, target a population uh, based on disparate um, clustered political views. So the idea of, of echo chambers in the network as many of you are aware, um, it, it was a, initially thought that uh, echo chambers were were strong, uh, strongly uh, evident in the in the online community, um, and so um, as I said, when um, a lot of this research started several years ago, or, or it uh, started to gain momentum, um, there was uh, disparate views about the idea of echo chambers and. Um, the research I was looking at uh, showed strong indication uh, of echo chamber formation online, and um, I would argue that uh, the idea of echo chambers has, has only uh, increased in legitimacy uh, over time. Now, um, realizing that uh, you know, clustering around how we cluster individuals and how we map them, um, a lot of debate on that, and there'll be continued research in that area. But I offer this as a beginning slide just to show some of the work that was done. Not by me, but by uh, MIT, um, and to show the, the ways in which these clusters can be visualized um, in map. And so, like I said, just like in traditional conflict, there's going to be associated targeting uh, of different uh, groups, or you know, you think of uh, geographic locations, strategic areas, centers of gravity, those sorts of things. So that's really what um, motivated me to start looking at this. And uh, obviously, I found the topic to be to be fascinating, and still do. Um, it also, in the early stages of things, uh, from a threat perspective, we wanted to look at if I was uh, a threat actor, a nation state threat actor, uh, most likely in the intelligence business, uh, where would I focus, and how would I uh, weaponize, you know, this uh, so so you know, a weakness um, across social media or a vulnerability within a certain um, democracy. And, and we came up with this model, this idea that um, a covert agent 
uh, will infiltrate uh, one of the echo chambers, uh, will masquerade as a true believer, so to speak, uh, will gain credibility by um, supporting or sharing uh, what the group believes to be legitimate information, and then at a predetermined time, perhaps uh, would plant information that was based on that particular nation state's um, specific uh, objectives. And um, we built this fairly early on, and it, it was based on very scant evidence. And I would argue that uh, there's been uh, significant evidence uh, to point to uh, this is a preferred method particularly nation state individuals, but also replicate um, linking to an influencer and uh, getting that influencer or motivating that influencer to share the information or the content that you are attempting to promote um, is extremely important. Um, and obviously social media has recognized that in, um, in some of the actions they've taken against uh, specific influencers. Um, we also tried to model the spread of this. And, and I know in the primer there was uh, you know, infodemiology was mentioned. Uh, I was around for kind of the start of that discussion uh, with my research. And, and we really did try to model this from the standpoint of um, a virality model that, that, that most people now are more familiar with because of COVID, but uh, a continuous time, uh, ordinary differential equations model that models uh, individuals moving from different states and so um, it, it was fairly clunky at first, um, and, and, and there are many areas to, to argue back and forth, so I welcome any, any questions on this. But the idea of uh, you know, having a susceptible population that's exposed to specific content, and then um, we consider the infected individuals those that update their belief states, right? So invasion probability, uh, with new information, we update our belief states based on information we receive. So the idea that you up, updated a belief state uh, in the way in which the information was targeted would mean that you were infected. And then this idea of recovery, which I know we're going to talk about later um, uh, in this uh, forum. But um, and, and trust me, the, the, these are these are day long conversations about each one of these states. But we were attempting to, to quantitatively model it. And this is what we what we started with, at least. The next concept we wanted to look at was susceptibility. So again, along the idea um, of a of a pandemic model, um, you know what what features made someone more susceptible, um, and and this honestly uh, was not um, based in any hard data initially. This was something we constructed based on um, some very early surveys that were out there to show you know who would be most potentially most susceptible, and the idea was the the very young because perhaps they did not have a lot of uh, background knowledge on specific topics to, for them to be able to recognize uh, that information was, was false that they were being presented with, and maybe the very old. So I, the idea being that um, one, very strong confirmation bias, and two, uh, the idea of their single, their single uh, use uh, social media users. So they're, they're uh, you know, digital immigrants, not digital natives, um, they, you know, the, the idea of a grand, grand, grandfather, grandmother getting on Facebook for only one purpose, which is to look at pictures of grandkids, and then they're presented with a news article that appears, by all indicators, to be legitimate, and uh, and they don't, they don't really have the the knowledge to be able to verify or or to question the information they're being presented. Along those lines, we also looked at political affiliation. So the idea of um, I'm susceptible to different types of content based on my prior beliefs, my, my cognitive biases. And uh, we, we did take a look at uh, this Hidden Tribes uh, study that's that's been out a while now, but the idea that we can break up uh, the US political uh, spectrum in greater detail than just left, right, center, or you know, Republican, Democrat, uh, moderate, and um, and I, you, I think we're starting to see some, some further evidence again, but the online echo chamber mirror at that some level. Um, and then that's where I start to try to target my, my influence. Again, if I'm, if I'm focused on uh, polarization for polarization's sake or division for division's sake. Um, and I think the same applies to, to terrorist ideology. This is just an outcome to show that like if, if we're targeting, we wanted a method to try to, to illustrate quantitatively 
the impact of targeted content, right? So not, we, we, we assumed that if I'm out on the fringes in these echo chambers and in these spheres that I'm more tightly coupled, right? And, and almost inherently from a bias perspective in our mind, although we're not um, psychology uh, experts, the idea being that the, 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 the probability of infectivity of, of this information is stronger uh, if you're out on the fringes and um, your exposure probability is stronger because you're more tightly coupled in these smaller uh, online communities. And we made it even more complex because we broke those, those the, this model into different structures and the structures represent different susceptibility to um, specific um, um, types of disinformation. So again, based on age or based on internet usage or you know, you, you name, you know, the political spectrum, et cetera. Then, then this is as an example, but we did some modeling associated with that where we, we tried different countermeasures uh, associated with this is the idea of quarantining, the idea of um, unequal allocation of what's called stubborn agents. So a stubborn agent, think of it as a bot. So in earlier er, early research on this, stubborn agents were individuals in the information domain that uh, influenced but were not influenced in return. So their opinion never changed. So that was what we used as like a bot or um, you know, a covert agent with an agenda that was not really in the information environment to, to, to learn anything new, but to promote a, a certain ideology. And, um, and then we kind of tested some things where we, we, we had our bots battle their bots, so to speak, for the, for the, the conscious of the susceptible population. And it just showed that obviously uh, stubborn agents and the size of your stubborn agent population had a strong effect in our modeling on on the um, on the the infectivity infectivity level of the of the uh, susceptible population and and how fast the the information was spread. And then um, this is another slide that kind of demonstrates that concept that that um, much stronger response when you have a larger um, multiple of stubborn agents. We did an online survey a few years ago, a rank order. This was an American survey. Um, the, the top uh, eight individuals uh, that they most trusted. So we picked a, a group of the most famous Americans, those politicians, it was uh, you know, talk show hosts, it was athletes. We had them rank order their trust, their trust in, in those agents from most trusted to least trusted. And then we asked them to rank order their agreement in certain statements from most agree to least agree. And then we presented information to the, the individual based on their level of trust of the communicator. And we wanted to see, you know, what was the response from people you least trusted telling you something that you agreed with, but also that you disagreed with. And then the, the, the inverse is, is the same. So it's, it's a very detailed study that I'm, I'm happy to go into, but the results were very interesting. I think the main takeaway was that uh, there is this residual effect of the deep fake environment, uh, you know, AI and machine learning to drive targeted uh, disinformation that's, uh, that's more realistic because of, uh, of deep fake construction and, and different feature set um, uh, kind of targeting. Thank you, Travis. Next up, we have Jared Holt from the Atlantic Council. Jared? Uh, hey, everybody. I don't have any slides. Um, I was asked to talk about the role of mis and disinfo and extremist movements, how social platforms function in that equation, and some other online dynamics in play that keep people in these movements that aren't necessarily algorithms. So that's a bit more conceptual. So um, I'll just keep it uh, to spoken words. So been hearing about misinformation, disinformation, falsehoods, conspiracy theories, and the like. And when we're broaching the topic of extremism, it's important to understand all of those things as kind of the, the gasoline or petrol that those movements run on. Um, hate movements and extremist movements, frankly, need misinformation in order to keep themselves going. Um, you know, a lot of hate movements and conspiratorial worldviews are learned worldviews. And those worldviews don't often square with reality as it truly exists. So to keep up the facade and to keep up 
that perception of reality, there has to be a constant reinforcement of that worldview. Now, social media companies uh, and, and the platforms that we all use for good things and uh, you know, some people use for bad things are designed in a way that makes reinforcement kind of part of the business model. So platforms are designed to reinforce and uh, intensify broad numbers of topics. So a sort of non-political example I'll give is that I play guitar. So that's my interest area. So I might go onto YouTube and watch a video tutorial for a song or a review for a piece of equipment I'm maybe considering purchasing. YouTube or a site like it will see that I watch those videos and recommend me more videos like that. So throughout the years, you know, a passing interest in learning different things about guitar playing or equipment uh, has developed into, uh, you know, basically me going on YouTube anytime and getting these very obscure videos about like rare equipment or offhand techniques. And I use that as an example because it's apolitical and doesn't have a political context, but kind of just shows the function of how uh, the algorithms of these websites that feed us content uh, kind of approach it. So, you know, these algorithms are designed to keep people on their platforms and by reinforcing and deepening people's interests and in things, uh, that is a often very lucrative way for them to keep them on the platform and then in turn sell the attention to advertisers or uh, so be it. And as that has happened with guitar playing, that can happen in a political context too, and sometimes generate some really ugly byproducts. Um, and then of course, there's also uh, the instances where that kind of content just comes to a user um, because of a you know, less related thing. Um, something unrelated to algorithms, as far as mis and disinformation and extremism goes, um, that doesn't always get talked about as much is that the communities online that traffic in this kind of thing often have a very distinct parasocial component to them, uh, which is why some people, like for example, in the QAnon space, end up sticking around even as things get disproven over and over again. Um, particularly in the last year or so, a lot of those communities have encouraged antisocial behavior toward outgroups or people who don't share the beliefs, or it could be, uh, as was mentioned before, government or uh, minority groups. And there's even been kind of an uptick that we've been seeing at the DFR lab, uh, you know, talking about building a parallel society of sorts. Um, this idea is starting to catch on more in extremist movements online. Um, not the prevailing thought currently, but definitely enough to get our interest. So when people, adopt these kind of ideas and start to make them their own. Um, you know, whether it is Facebook groups, YouTube comment communities, live stream chats, a lot of people will develop these kind of parasocial relationships or social relationships. Some will go on to join organized groups and more distinguished social clubs. And this takes things beyond this stage of reinforcement and to a stage that has social value for the person. And when that happens, you know, it's not as simple as fact checking something or debunking something because the stakes to an individual that gets wrapped up in that feel a lot higher. They end up having more to lose. Um, so considering that element, um, you know, all of these things really, the the way it relates and uh, you know, the role that just simply being on social media could exacerbate an issue. And also you know, those additional components uh, is really important if we wanna think about taking a holistic approach to trying to get to the other side of these issues. All right, thank you, Jared. Next up, we have Rachel Brown from Project Over Zero. Rachel. Thank you so much. I am gonna share a few very simple slides and hopefully tee up some insights to 
um, add an additional dimension and enrich this conversation on top of this really phenomenal analysis um, and deep dive into extremist communities and how they operate from the other panelists. I actually come out of the world of atrocity prevention and political violence prevention, really with a focus on the way communication is wielded and weaponized um, to fuel and foment us them dynamics. And also if you think about what mass atrocity situations are, it's about a society moving to the extreme, right? It's about the type of extreme targeted violence that we're talking to, but what it takes and what it looks like when a society accepts the types of narratives, justification, misinformation um, that, that is used to justify it. So um, again, this is just a little compilation of insights that might help us um, zoom out a little bit and look at um, the, the broader mainstream narratives, not only how um, extremist groups gain a broader foothold in the mainstream, but how mainstream narratives and um, ideas help create an opening and a vulnerability for these types of extremist narratives that are so fueled by the type of mis and disinformation we're discussing today. So the first thing I want to talk about from um, the world of atrocity prevention, of violence prevention, there are really clear patterns in the types of narratives that are used to justify mass violence or used to justify the targeting of entire groups of people and civilians with harm. And these patterns, um, the content looks different across contexts, but there are really strong similarities in the frameworks that are used um, and they it's unsurprising when we look at some of the psychosocial dynamics that they tap into. So the first set of patterns has to do with how, how the other is discussed. That could be the other as the government or the group in power, a different partisan group, a racial, religious, or ethnic minority, et cetera. But common threads at this sort of macro level are the idea of an existential threat, that the group that's being created as an us is somehow under existential threat, that could be a security threat, a threat to our way of life, um, a threat to our status and power in society. But the idea that a group poses an existential threat um, creates a justification for violence and even a logic that says we must be violent um, as self-defense. Guilt and collective blame are also a really important process. The idea that those being targeted are guilty and collectively as a group um, share some sort of guilt or blame um, for wrongs, um, for violence against the in-group members um, have Often these are narratives of rape um, and, and narratives of threat or guilt um, of harms against women. Same with threat, they're coming for our women and children. And then there's of course dehumanization, the idea that they're somehow not fully human or, or not fully as human as us. I'm going through this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of research and frameworks here. The other set of narratives I think it's really important to discuss, and this kind of taps into that social piece that Jared was ending on, um, are the narratives about us and the strengthening of the identity of the us that needs to be protected um, and the mobilization within that framework. So the valorization of violence as what it means to be a good group member, as what it means to have status and respect within the group. Um, this is often framed in terms of protection, right? It's not just I'm violent to be violent, it's violent on behalf of the group and in protection of the group. Um, these narratives also have a strong bend towards the future. This violence is necessary to secure our future um, or to build a better future. Um, and they frame violence as the only option, right? So, so you can see how these things come together. There's a stronger fusion and salience of the us that's being created um, alongside an existential threat, a group that's already guilty and that's somehow less than human or completely de-identified from the us. Um, so violence, again, becomes painted not only as justified, but necessary and a necessary thing to do or to support as a group member. Um, under the surface, these are really powerful narratives because they tap into some very foundational human um, emotions we're sensitive to threat. If you can activate fear, if you can activate contempt and grievance, um, these are things that mobilize um, uh, people collectively and again are very hard to compete with or overcome. So um, those fear narratives, those threat narratives, there's a reason they spread quickly and they catch traction. They also tap into these dynamics around belonging, around our need to stay part of our group, around our perception of what's normal or what our group 
believes or feels or is doing. Um, and then the social identity and in, in highly polarized societies where our social identity becomes more singularly or rigidly defined by our partisan identity, our religious identity, our racial identity, et cetera, um, that those incentives and even the, um, the our dynamics of cognition <clears throat> and how we process information become more and more attached um, to our social identity. This is even called um, socially or identity motivated cognition. Um, and there's actually really recent research, I think even last week just out on identity fusion where we're very fused to our in-group. And if our group then holds a value as sacred and we're given misinformation about that type of sacred value, we're not even turning on our cognition to think about whether that information is accurate or not. So these identity and group dynamics are really, really powerful. And what I really want to note, all of these patterns I just talked about, and we can look at historical examples of dating far back, um, pre-social media, and also today with social media, they are fueled, they rest on, um, and they are quote unquote proven by mystics and malinformation, because those narratives about the outgroup are never true. It's never true that an entire group is an existential threat or is inherently rotten and guilty. It, it requires an evidence base that's often manufactured and created through the use of, and I really liked the, the pre-reading, the way it really broke down the sort of different types of mystics and malinformation. But you can think commonly, again, to use the example, um, a rape, a crime, something really heinous that's committed by a member of a targeted group gets used to say, look, the whole group is guilty. There was an example just now about protesters, right? There's an instance, there's a clash, a protester does something. It's used to say, look, all the protesters are a threat and we need to take action. So um, this malinformation, I think, is really powerful and deserves attention um, and opens the door for even more fully fabricated um, information to be spread. Um, oops. I know we have limited time. So the point I just wanted to make is that when we understand what's going on within these extremist communities, one of the things I think we need to think about is how does it relate to the mainstream narratives? How far of a stretch it is and how large is the gap between what we're hearing in the mainstream um, and between what you're hearing sort of at the edges of these extremist groups. So we need to think how much as a society are we moving towards the edge of that rabbit hole and how far is that edge of that rabbit hole moving into um, our mainstream collectively. And I think part of what we have to ask is what is the current narrative landscape that's considered as normal? Um, you know, what are the things that are held as true by different groups in our society or that you're seeing on the media? And how are they opening the door for some of these more extremist narratives um, and the mis and disinformation that fuels them? And what is the, um, what, what are we seeing um, in terms of mis and disinformation in the mainstream that's also being used in support of this? We have to understand the intergroup dynamics and the frames of different groups where we are in a highly divided society. What are the narrative frames that exist within different groups and open up different vulnerabilities? to the mis and disinformation and extremism. And then we have to look at where um, the mis and disinformation and the narratives that they're being used to fuel are being validated, repeated, um, whether in coded language or in, in small references by epistemic authorities and other authority figures, political leaders that are seen as really important role models or social norm reference within groups. Again, um, to that point of, of um, increasing familiarity with this information, making it actually seem more normalized and less extreme so that um, it's easier to get to that extreme point. And also um, extremist actors are acting within an environment where there is a broader set of moral agreement with the ideas, even if not with the most extreme um, pieces of information. And I, as we go into the next panel, which I think focuses really specifically on clinical and individual level interventions, um, I wanna tee up that as, in addressing this full problem, we have to look at the full ecosystem as well and those pathways between the mainstream and the extreme, those points of potential intervention, the factors, and ask ourselves, what are the factors that are making this a permissive environment that are sending so many people into the space where they need that one-on-one -on -one intervention? How can we stop that flow and what can we shift in the mainstream environment? Um, knowing that these individual pieces of misinformation and disinformation and malinformation and specific events, you know, the idea of catalyzing events that are bringing these extremist groups together that we talked about, it's because they're fitting into these broader narratives. So can we understand this broader structure for intervention? And again, I just wanna point out that those belonging, those identity needs, 
um, and dynamics that are at play are so core to why people are spreading this mis and disinformation and the dynamics of how it works. And that's going to be really essential for any intervention and taking group and identity, um, identity fusion into account is also going to mean that we really have to think um, in terms of broader interventions about the messengers that are being used um, and the different group identities that can be activated to give some people alternative spaces of belonging or, or pull them in different directions. So it was a lot kind of quickly, but hopefully that tees up an additional angle. Um, and I'm glad to have been able to be on a panel with such uh, incredible other speakers. Thank you, Rachel. That was incredible. So uh, now we get to the audience participation uh, portion. Please, uh, audience, if, if you can, if you're willing, uh, turn on your cameras and join the conversation. Um, you are welcome to either uh, put your questions in the chat, um, use the raise hand function, unfortunately, or fortunately, there are so many of you that I can't just see you all on one screen, uh, to call on hands I see without that raise hand function. Uh, but please populate the, populate the chat, raise your hand. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to ask the most basic of questions because I'm not sure we covered it, um, which is, can one of you please uh, define the difference between mis, dis, and malinformation for those who may be less familiar? I know you can all answer this question. Jared, I'm gonna call on you. Uh, I think the difference mostly gets into intentionality. Um, so misinformation would be a false claim uh, that is spread as if it is an earnestly true claim. Uh, disinformation would be a knowingly false claim spread as a true claim. Um, and then malinformation, I don't use that term as often in my work, but I think of it the same way that I think of BS, which is like bad information with no regard for its truth value. Um, maybe someone else who <laughs> does more malinformation stuff would have a better definition of that. John, did I get your name right this time? <laughs> it did. Uh, yeah, a little bit like Jared, it's not something that's uh, in, in my wheelhouse as much, but I, I just see it as kind of the weaponized use of it, even someone's personal information, so maybe doxing and things like that. So just to, to turn someone's private information or a, a company as well or something like that, but to turn it against them either by releasing it uh, into the public domain by hacking or something like this, or by uh, passing it on to more hostile actors who may turn to try and um, you as the, as the bad actor, first of all, maybe auctioning it off and then passing it on to, to other bad actors who may, who may post online themselves or use it for their own, for their own operations too, but essentially weaponizing uh, someone's information, especially personal information. All right, thank you for that. So we have our first question from the audience and it comes from at uh, Jordan out of Rand. Uh, how should the US government approach tackling mis, dis, and malinformation, especially given the First Amendment and credible messenger concerns? Which agencies, if any, uh, should be involved? Go for it, Travis. Yeah, I, can, I, I guess maybe I'm naturally suited to answer that one. So let me first say that I'm not speaking for the US government. This is Travis talking. Um, but, um, so I think, uh, that, uh, the approach has to be, uh, easy answer. It has to be whole of government, uh, in the same way that responded to, uh, terrorism. Um, so there will be an intelligence, um, community component to this. There will be a defense component to this. Um, we're doing similar activities in the way of cyber, like what we're seeing kind of how we define cyber and the threats we're using against traditional, what we would view as traditional cyber, uh, the, the US government um, responding in areas that, that, that um, very few, I think, uh, had envisioned. Um, and so I, I, it's, it's uh, extremely complex, but I think along those core functions uh, for established government entities, there are areas in which they can 
can support the effort against um, this type of nefarious activity. Uh, with that said, um, it does prevent, present unique challenges, um, particularly for the intelligence community of which they may be the best suited um, to develop a capability to most aggressively counter specifically nation state supported or nation state enabled uh, information warfare of this type. Um, so the First Amendment um, certainly um, I, one of the one of the very important uh, things to consider um, along uh, on the IC side of the house, the same concept applies on Fourth Amendment right in cyber in the same way that um, the USG at large was not prepared um, effectively to respond to terrorism. And um, we can argue um, at length about whether we, we still are not. Uh, but there was a whole of government focus on this, this uh, on terrorism. And I think at the end of the day, the U.S. government uh, has to address uh, this scourge in a similar in a similar manner. Um, and it's probably going to require new regulation, new policy, new authorities. Um, and uh, perhaps in the terrorist realm, you have the same as in the terrorist realm. And in the cyber realm, you have these issues of authorities and traditional definitions of what these organizations do don't match with the threat that we're seeing. And so um, long answer to a short question, but I appreciate it. Do any of our other panelists wanna jump in on that one? Uh, sure, I'll jump in. I, I don't think it's the role of the US government. And I think there's gonna be a lot of legal headaches and stuff if it tries to get into the job of policing ideology. Um, what I think the US government is best postured to do is to, um, maintain a situational awareness on the issue uh, to the degree uh, that it protects public safety and national security. Um, that, that's sort of the role I see. Um, as far as combating this on a broader scale, I think this is kind of a whole of society issue. It's going to take many efforts on many fronts. And certainly there's portions of the US government that can um, empower and encourage those fronts. Um, but as far as U.S. government getting uh, directly involved in sort of the political judgments that are involved in countering these problems, I don't, my personal view is that it's completely inappropriate. And Rachel, did you want to weigh in? Sure, I don't have that much to add. I mean, I think it's worth considering, um, and this is a whole space of work that I will not profess to be expert at and probably others can speak more to. I mean, it, regulation around social media platforms is clearly an area of a lot of discussion and, and away from the sort of, um, you know, the, the question of policing really specific pieces of misinformation, thinking about how we actually govern these, these new spaces and the new challenges is important. I also think it's important to ask, in addition to some of the more like hard power tactical approaches, what is the soft power? Where do different branches and levels of government have convening power to bring different players and stakeholders together to think about how to address this issue um, and leveraging that as well as support to efforts that are out there. I also think um, there's a the, the situational awareness goes together with a do no harm element. Um, I think being aware of the ways in which it's pretty easy to inadvertently give a broader platform to these groups, to, to extremist groups and to miss a disinformation based on how you talk about it, um, ensuring a baseline level of sort of that type of do no harm education across government branches that are making public statements. Um, this is a really specific small thing, but I actually think that that's pretty important um, in terms of use of the public comms platform. And Sharon, you shared an infographic that looks like it speaks to some of that situational awareness. Do you want to just contextualize that? Yeah, it's just really base level helpful tips, kind of step one kind of advice. And I mean, the infographic uses the term fake news, which has a little bit of a political history um, and it's quite redundant by now. I mean, miss, dis and, and malinfo are much more uh, descriptive, but it just has very simple things. And, and essentially it all comes back to, I mean, if I'm ever speaking to someone and I'm kind of asked, uh, how do you judge or what are your tips for people? My tips are always the same question, the source, can you stand over who has produced the content or produced the opinion. And this is a, a big case in, in things like forwarded WhatsApp messages or, or these kind of chain viral messages that seem to come from someone's uncle's brother who works close to the, the military or whatever it might be. Uh, and then and be curious about the source and also 
try and be reflective and ask, you know, is this is this claim or this piece of information um, trying to get an emotional reaction, especially anger uh, and fear, because they're the most often activating emotions. And um, but just just a lot of helpful tips. Um, and that uh, leads us into our next question. Are there existing or promising tools and resources that you can recommend to average citizens uh, to prevent and counter mis and malinformation? So we just had one. Are there others out there that you would recommend? You're too okay, polite, Rachel. Rita, steal me. Rachel, you're, you're both too you first. polite here. Okay, Jared, go. Okay, um, resources. Um, for me, but, I mean, the way I look at it, situational awareness is everything. Um, and then there's just countless resources um, depending on uh, kind of the approach that uh, you want to take in trying to counter this, whether it is understanding it from a psychological perspective or understanding it from a criminal perspective, a tech perspective. Um, I mean, there's a whole host of great resources. First Draft News is a really great place um, as far as it interacts with the media environment. There's, uh, you know, sort of the legacy groups in this space, like the Southern Poverty Law Center, the ADL. Um, yeah, I, I, there's countless great resources and it's kind of almost hard for me to like <laughs> rapid fire them off the top of my head just because um, especially in the last five or six years, there's just been so much additional resources going in to trying to understand these problems as they the problems have kind of become more evident and pernicious in society. Um, so it's out there if you want to look and uh, if anybody has like a specific interest area, um, or, or an angle that they're looking at um, exactly, I'll drop my email in the chat and I'd be happy to provide a more like, specific recommendation if it's helpful. Yeah. Um, and I would say to, to just echo those points, there are a ton of resources out there and it really depends where in the ecosystem are you engaging? Are you trying to engage with someone that's sort of all in on the mis and disinformation? Are you trying to engage with someone that you see starting to consume? Are you trying to use your public platform to undermine the impact of mis dis malinformation? Um, so I was gonna suggest even um, it might be worth the panelists and others sort of compiling and, and happy to share back or um, help I, I think something that when we're talking to individuals, one of the things that we often, I think it's also important, you know, we're, there's legal, there, there's all the different ways to deal with it, but we're talking about interpersonal interactions or using your own platform. I think one of the really important things is to assess who you are as a messenger, who are you connected to, who listens to you, um, who comes to you for different advice. And I think that um, considering are you using a broad platform or are you a leader somehow in your community um, that's putting out more public facing content to a broader group or you, I think the next session will really get into the more one on one engagement, but I think the first thing is to really figure out what are your goals and at what level are you engaging and then ideally connect to others because I think part of what happens is people go it alone and it can be really hard and frustrating and being able, even if it's a small um, group of peers or others that that. Um, that you feel supported with. I actually think that's something we found really important to work with pastors and works with others that are looking to address this in their communities. Um, they, it matters to be connected to each other. So the more you can also create a look at the sort of center of gravity for that, I think the better. So uh, Emily Thompson and Kim Locke are both weighing in on the importance of doing this with youth in particular. You know, Travis, some of your research was looking at susceptibility among youth. Um, there's a recommendation of Kurt Braddock's research, but also a recognition that we need to potentially intervene earlier than high school. So uh, any additional perspectives on um, addressing this topic with you? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, we, we go around, you know, media literacy and um, understanding um, more about journalistic practice and and how things um, how content is created um, in the most professional uh, case and in the least professional case. Um, I think all of that is important. Um, I also think that 
you know, just generally on the on the child side, and this is not really my specific area of expertise, but I do have children, so um, I'm tr trying to formulate as a parent some of the things that I can do, which is um, it, it just um, overall limiting um, their their uh, their experience to not only getting pulled into the virtual environment. Um, too deeply um, and, and spending too much time um, in, in those types of conversations, quite honestly. Um, it, you know, I, I, lots of studies around, you know, how it, 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 um, it starts to, to um, change and manipulate, uh, you know, kind of what we see as the world um, and, and our reality. And, um, you know, I just think that um, I, I'm not sure how you stop this train. I'm not sure how you reverse course on the, the social media addiction because it's an expertly designed uh, addiction um, with, with some smart people in the world designed to, to facilitate it. But, um, you know, I, I think pulling back from that and I think learning to pull back from that at some level in, in development and not um, creating uh, so much value and virtue in it. Uh, way easier said than done. The last thing I'll say uh, or to the earlier question is all sides news, I think, is a great reference, right? Like, um, because it's, it's generally going to pair matched uh, content against each other of different political, um, perceived political bias across the media landscape. And so, um, you know, for, for individuals that may be um, less sophisticated users, um, it'll show you a side by side comparison. I don't know what the returns are on. I don't know how, the efficacy of how well it works on, on moving individual opinion. I know some of my relatives, it, it may be more challenging, but um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a great question, but uh, you know, a, a very challenging answer as we have seen, and I think we'll continue to see. All right, uh, Heidi, Pam, and Jean, I want to flag Sammy Wick's question for you at 8.53 a.m. I think that's a question better suited for your panel, um, but as specifically the impact on individuals with severe and persistent mental illness versus those who are locked into extremely, these extreme beliefs but do not have any mental health diagnoses. So know that that question is coming uh, if you want to work it into your remarks, or we can save it for the Q&A either way. Uh, but Sammy, thank you for that question. We will absolutely get to it. All right. Um, so Emily mentions uh, the sophistication level of some of these mis- and disinformation efforts is increasing, which can impact some of the situational awareness um, any, any thoughts on that while I keep writing down in the, reading down in the chat? Yeah, I, I'll just say, I, I mentioned deep fakes. I mean, I think, um, the, the concept of artificial intelligence is often oversold in general and in, in, in decision-making, um, typically artificial intelligence, it works well with things that are very repeatable and recordable, right? So it, it tends to work fairly well with a lot of inputs, huge data sets on driving, but it doesn't work as well um, in other decision-making contexts. But what I will say is uh, given how we really only need a teaser uh, for our minds with some of the information, particularly the information that preys upon our bias, I do think that AI could be leveraged along with advancements in, in deep fakes and how well we remember video or believe video over um, just you know, text. Um, and so, uh, you know, I am concerned about the ability to use AI to distribute massive amounts of information targeted that's developed from a sophisticated uh, standpoint uh, with video and, and other features that may target someone specifically to, get to, to really key in on or to, to feel like the information was directed specifically at them. I haven't seen that level of sophistication yet, um, but you know, I, I, it, it is in development. Um, there, it is un, 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 undoubtedly in development um, by governments and otherwise. So um, you know, whether that is actually, um, we, we often don't see the highest uh, cyber weapon threats out there. Um, you know, they, they made, they're, they're held in secret. 
Um, but this is a technology that I think uh, there's a commercial aspect to, and not to mention a political aspect to. So um, it, when it is developed, I think we will see it. And I think, um, you know, again, these techniques to try to counter it are going to be more challenging. There, there is some hope in the sense of like being able to identify uh, digital deep fakes and, you know, um, a, a technology associated with that, um, which is also uh, in development. And, and but, I, but in, I think the attacker, to use that phrase, uh, the purveyor, has the advantage in, in most of these contexts. So we, we generally have to we'll be responding and not necessarily proactively uh, countering. And so it, it's it, it's a great point. It's 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 uh, it, it bothers me. It it, it concerns me uh, greatly given what I've seen the development and particularly in deepfakes over the last five years. They've gotten much better and much more uh, easily created. All right, and I see that John has his hand up. And then Rachel, I'm coming to you with the very next question. So I'll let you circle back. John, go for it. Thanks. And this is for Travis. Back, you know, when you're talking about people being susceptible to fake news, two points to one is the fake news you had, how many deviations from baseline were they that caused the susceptibility? And the reason I'm asking that is one of the things we're working on, you know, after the Aurora theater shooting, working with the folks who were in the theater, one of the things we started seeing was what we call decoding errors where people were in there <clears throat> and while he's doing his thing, they didn't see it as real. So one of the things we're looking at is what's called context and context error and how much does context error contribute to decoding in the brain. And I don't know if you've dissected those in terms of some of your research. So, um... You've gone deeper uh, in in that particular than than we looked at. Um, we w the way we tried to break it up at least initially was we tried to see if there was a difference in like taste based belief. So in in our list of uh, agree disagree, we had you know, your favorite color, your favorite um, ice cream, and then we had some uh, specific focus on what we think would be very partisan political divides, right? So on you know, perhaps immigration. Our, our climate or, or you know you name your your polarizing issue of the day and um, you know, what, what we found which was interesting um, it, that it, this is a small takeaway is, is you know the the uh, the cognitive bias works stronger on the, the polarizing aspect of the political uh, ideas right like so this idea that um, I was perhaps more tolerant of someone, having a taste-based preference um, and my and I was also um, less amplified, less engaged um, all along those things that were considered taste-based versus the political component, right? Like the political activation um, was, uh, was very strong. And so um, I, I know that doesn't directly uh, address uh, the point there. Um, we, in, in short answer, we did not look at it from that vein. Um, but we did try to dissect from the standpoint of, of different um, different types of belief and, and how they were they were impacted differently from a from a disinformation standpoint. Thank you. So Rachel, I'm gonna uh, come to you first with Heidi Ellis's question, uh, and you can speak, share what you were going to share uh, just before I went to John a second ago uh, here as well. But who holds the responsibility for disseminating all of the resources we've talked about today, the resources that are populating faster than I can read in the chat, which we will get around to everyone as a follow-up and panelists, we will come to you for additional resources. Uh, and, uh, and I also got a direct message um, from the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships highlighting the CISA resources out of DHS as well. So we will share all of these um, following this workshop. But uh, the question for you, Rachel, and any other panelists who wants to tackle it, um, who holds the responsibility for disseminating these resources? Is it teachers, clergy, mental health professionals, parents, all of the above? I think Jared, Jared mentioned earlier a whole of society, but um, who's best positioned uh, to share these resources and who should take that responsibility? 
Um, I'll say really quickly what I was going to say before on that question of AI, which is that um, I think we have to recognize that there will continue to be new technologies that can be pretty easily weaponized and used to fuel these dynamics further. Some of the things that we can do proactively are to ask what makes us vulnerable as a society um, and ask how we can address that so that as these new technologies come online, we hopefully have a little more lead time to figure out how to manage and mitigate their uses. Um, but you can imagine if they come into the environment that we're in right now, um, the, the level of impact that they can have is greatly fueled um, and supported by, by the level to which we already have buy-in to some of these conspiracies beliefs, extremes. Um, and, and I think it's actually really important that we think about what's coming down the pipeline um, and what's coming next and, and think proactively in a way I think that wasn't done with social media. First, it was the savior of democracy and everything, and then it was the ruin of everything rather than a really nuanced analysis of how it would interact with our cognitive processes, biases, how we are hardwiring as humans, the existing conflicts in our societies, et cetera. I think we need to do that with new technologies. Um, I think this question um, on who's responsible was answered really wonderfully in the chat, which is everyone, and it is that whole of society approach. Um, again, I think when we look at, at the degree to which this is happening at extremes, the emboldening of the extremes, we have to look at our whole society that's making it possible, and we're going to need a lot of different approaches, a lot of different interventions from different angles, different messengers, different um, types of leaders in order to solve the level of um, the problem that that we have. Um, and I think it's not just about um, that all of the examples, clergy, teachers, medical health professionals. I think we can think about different types of stakeholder groups and what they need, right? So a medical health professional that's coming face to face with mis disinformation every single day, what does that sector need? What are they saying that they need as they're also being attacked and targeted with mis and disinformation? What do they need to be able um, to get a handle on what's going on in terms of the attacks on them to uh, have that situational awareness of what are the mis and disinformation narratives? So they're not hearing it first from someone that's coming in to speak with them, right? They're equipped, um, they have the best practices and, and they have a tailored resource for their setting. We also need to figure out how, um, how can clergy not only be prepared um, to address this, but how can we encourage them to use their platforms in ways that make their congregants less vulnerable to mis and disinformation, that ask them to start questioning at a deeper level, that set norms um, and address some of the narratives that are, um, th those narrative constructs that, that this mis and disinformation is feeding into. Um, we need to ask about key players, mayors, city leaders, business leaders, how can they be using their platform? And so I think, um, it's not just about getting resources to people, it's actually about figuring out what it's going to take to activate them in the unique ways that they can use their platforms as a leader and identifying sort of the tools, resources, skills um, that, that they need in order to support them to do that. As well as, like I said, I think that that, um, that peer-to-peer -peer support and that ongoing guidance sort of in network building is really important because I think one of the things that we see is that this environment is constantly evolving. And so it's not just a one-off. And I see that there's additional thread in the chat and I'm glad to see that. It's not just a one-off, here's a resource, use it now. It's also about developing those relationships and those networks of the key leaders and sectors that we need to be addressing this issue for ongoing engagement and learning from and with each other, um, but also being able to have access to new tools, new analysis, new resources. Um, and so I, I really actually think that there's a lot of work to be done to actually build the type of infrastructure on the sort of human civil society level that we are going to need to continue to tackle this problem at scale. And as yep. it changes. Go for it, Jared. Uh, yeah, if I can just piggyback off of everything Rachel said. Um, well, there certainly is like you know, on the playing field, sophisticated actors thinking like nation states using more advanced technology and stuff. A huge chunk of the landscape is just homegrown. It's things happening, you know, on live streams, people with cameras and lights they bought off Amazon and setting up in a spare bedroom and becoming overnight stars, making lots of money, getting making names for themselves, getting constantly reinforced, um, and you know, developing these little communities online where this kind of thing thrives. Um, and that is, you know, if we want to what I said earlier, whole of society, this really is kind of everybody's problem. And I, to echo and add to something Rachel said, I think 
The solution to this problem foundationally is going to require identifying a clear moral vision of what kind of society we want to defend, um, being one that is based in reality and truth and fairness, and um, you know, spreading that moral vision and getting people to defend it. If you're playing soccer out on the field and you walk away from the goal, you know, I'm not going to feel so bad for you if the other team scores a point, right? So it's about uh, that maintenance and that cultivation and uh, the promotion of the kind of society that we want to live in um, because people are knocking at the gate and it's kind of the put up or shut up moment. All right, so that concludes the Q&A for the first panel. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists and even greater thanks to all of our audience um, for engaging in the chat. Our last workshop had a little less engagement. Believe it or not, we were concerned as to whether or not there would be enough questions this workshop. Thank you for proving us wrong. Uh, we are always delighted to see active participation in the chat. Without further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Heidi Ellis. Uh, she joins us today from Boston Children's Hospital, uh, but just as importantly to me, um, she is core to the steering committee for the Prevention Practitioners Network, and she is going to introduce and moderate our next panel. Heidi. All right. Um, thank you, Brent. Hold on, I just lost my notes. There they are. Um, that was an amazing panel. Thank you so much for uh, setting the, the landscape. Um, and now if we can shift a little bit, we're, I want to think about at more of an individual level, what do we do with malice and disinformation? Um, first, I want to say how excited I am to have Jane and Pam speaking today. These are both exceptional clinicians who I've had the good fortune to occasionally work with at Children's Hospital. Um, and I don't think I can recall a conversation I've had with either of them when I haven't learned something new and come away really humbled by their clinical wisdom. So when on the steering committee, Brett first raised the idea of best practices for addressing malice or disinformation, I found myself thinking, hmm, I wonder what Pam and Jean would say. I wonder how they would approach this as seasoned clinicians who work with individuals all the time who come in with different belief systems, ideas, and convictions. I think in the field of terrorism and targeted violence, it's easy to exceptionalize individuals who hold radical, extreme, or hateful and hurtful beliefs. But really, we all hold belief systems, some of which are not helpful. Um, and clinicians have a wealth of experience in thinking about how to handle this. So what I'd like to do is to think a little bit about differing belief systems on a sort of continuum and ask Jean and Pam to share their thinking about how in their respective professions they might think about working with someone who holds false and potentially hurtful beliefs. When does something cross into territory that requires intervention and what does that look like? Um, and let me start with the side of the continuum where I've done a lot of work and where clearly we would never do intervention around different beliefs, which is working with an individual who is from a different culture. <clears throat> we can expect that someone from another culture than ours will hold a set of beliefs that comes from their culture. And those beliefs will likely be different than what I grew up with in my cultural beliefs. This scenario is pretty straightforward. Um, in my work with refugees, my job is to learn about and understand different cultural viewpoints and not to seek to change them. But then, you know, if you start thinking about this continuum of beliefs, it gets more complicated. Someone could come in believing their race is superior to another. Someone might believe that their religion is superior. Someone might believe their gender is superior. Someone might believe conspiracy theories such as QAnon. And if you push far enough out on this other end of the continuum, there are belief systems that justify violence and hatred. So as a clinician, how do you decide when a belief has crossed into dangerous or harmful territory? Do you address these beliefs? If so, how do you do that? <clears throat> so what I'm struggling with in my mind and hoping Pam and Jean will struggle with out loud is how do we think about addressing beliefs that arise from mal, mis, or disinformation? How do we do that? When do we do that? And what do we need to consider? 
Again, it's probably more the norm than the exception that a client holds a different worldview than a clinician, but when does that matter? <clears throat> so this is clearly an enormous topic with no clean answers. So I thought I'd pose a few framing questions that Pam and Jean can respond to or not in their remarks. And then we will move to more of a discussion like we were just having, and I'll try to moderate questions that come in um, to them. So Pam and Jean, here are some of my questions. Most broadly, when is a different belief system problematic or in need of being addressed in some way? And how might you do so within your profession and experience? Does this change depending on the age of the individual? I know there was a question in the chat about how do you address this with young people? So what if someone's an adolescent versus an adult? What if a family system endorses a set of beliefs? Or in, what if they have opposing beliefs to their kid? How might you approach change or how might your approach change depending on the circumstances of your clinical encounter? For instance, in a crisis intervention, setting versus in the context of a long-term therapeutic relationship. What do you see as the risks of addressing malmis or disinformation with a client? And what do you see of, as the risks of not addressing it? And finally, most generally, do you think mental health professionals have a role to play in countering malmis or disinformation? And if not, or in addition, who should this fall to? So with that, let me just briefly introduce Gene, and he'll go first, and then I'll introduce Pam. Uh, Gene D'Angelo is the Chief of the Division of Psychology and Director of Psychology Education in the Department of Psychiatry at Boston Children's Hospital. He has a wealth of experience in developmental psychopathology, psychology education and training, and in the adaptation of evidence-based practices to applied settings. Dr. Giangelo has been a past president of both the American Academy of Clinical Psychology and the Massachusetts Psychological Association, and is a past chair of the Association of Psychology Postdoctoral and Internship Centers. And he is famous to me as the person who welcomed me to Children's Hospital about 15 years ago by saying, I'm the guy who gets to solve your problems when you have them. So in that spirit, I'm going to ask him now to solve the problem of how to address mal, miss, and disinformation. Jean? Thank you very much. I, um, uh, I'm, I'm humbled by, by your, first of all, your introduction, and I think also by the scope of what you're asking us to, to try to address here, which I think are complicated, uh, complicated questions for us, uh, certainly. Just to begin with, I would say that the majority, at, at least for myself, the majority of my time is really focused in on uh, trying to address some of the major um, mental health problems that youth and their families are bringing to us. So, it, and at this point in time, and I think you've seen it in various media reports, um, we seem to be almost at an epidemic proportion of, of behavioral health, mental health kinds of problems in the country. In our own clinics alone, we have currently, as of this morning, in excess of 200 families waiting for outpatient services through our service system. We have 80 families whose children are boarding in the medical inpatient services who are really candidates for psychiatric hospitalization somewhere in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is a reasonably resourced state um, for individuals uh, with these kinds of mental health services, but there are no beds available for them. And so when, uh, when we begin to think about all of this, uh, actually that it's, it's those kinds of concerns and worries that sort of drive this and drive sort of the work that we're uh, attempting to uh, attempting to do. What I thought I would do um, as, as something potentially productive is for particularly for people who have been clinicians in the past uh, here uh, and have been involved in, in uh, services is to sort of uh, take a look at some of the things that we need to consider as we, we go into providing clinical care for, uh, for youth at this time, um, just very quickly. Um, first of all, I have no disclosures um, uh, or conflicts of interest to, uh, 
uh, to make note of in, in terms of my presentation here. Um, when I was in graduate school, I worked for Ed Borden as one of his research assistants at the, at the time, and he was somebody who was very interested in a working alliance, which has historically been considered to be one of the core elements of, of treatment um, and, and engagement in treatment for individuals, whether it's youth or it's uh, adults in times. And he looked at three, three things very quickly. There was an agreement on goals, an assignment of tasks for each of us to engage in, and then the, really the attempt to develop a bond. In other words, here's somebody sitting in front of me, whether it's a, a nine-year-old child or it is a 22-year-old adult in our situation. And part of my purpose and, and goal is to try to connect with them, have them see me as a potentially healthy person. There, there are differences in what we're doing as we look at an alliance between an adult, which is a, uh, you know, the patient sees a therapist specifically, and there's the bond and the alliance for them. In contrast, for children, there are multiple alliances that go into this. We have an alliance with parents, the child themselves, uh, secondarily with various agencies that um, would be involved in, in services for them, each of them nuancing what's going to go on in that relationship, hopefully in a, in a meaningful kind of way. Uh, in the research by uh, Holly and John Weiss, um, what they noticed was that in terms of parent clinician and child clinician uh, alliances, a positive parent clinician uh, alliance is most strongly associated with ultimately with keeping appointments and trying to complete that treatment that the parent is essential in trying to get that to go. The positive child clinician alliance is associated with uh, symptom improvement that we would have and also improvement and, and functionality as, as we would sort of uh, approach, the, uh, approach that particular uh, need and, and care for that patient. Um, in establishing that relationship with parents, they need a clear formulation. What are we thinking? What are we attempting to do? What are we attempting and proposing? Uh, what type of intervention and why we're doing that? We're, we're, we are willing to provide information about how we're going to evaluate it. Uh, we'll look at expectations uh, that, that parents may have for this process and try to respond to that. And that uh, how the information that, um, that is going to be shared will be useful and helpful to, to either understanding the proposed problems um, that, that are there or the potential interventions that we're undertaking for them. For children, this message is a little bit different. I think it, it's, it's much more focal with them in terms of that it is an, usually an open discussion with what, what has been presented as the concerns, either the concerns let's say of a parent or caregiver and or their own concerns that have been raised. Try to present yourself as a therapist who um, is somebody who wants to be helpful and, and, and try to reinforce that uh, without falsely promising something to someone becomes important. There's the belief that problems can actually be solved at that point and that the process of how we may go about this is being explained based on on the ongoing discussions would be uh, with that, that particular patient. And then there's ultimately the therapist's appreciation of the difficulty in confronting these problems and, and actually verbalizing that, that this is going to be a process that can, you know, at times while we're hopeful, can also be, uh, uh, you know, stressful for both of us, but that we're there together uh, to work on these kinds of uh, issues. Um, I pop this out of out of order. This is uh, there was a question at one point about whether or not um, uh, we should be involved in uh, as as mental health professionals in and being much more um, socially involved in in things and uh, in, in responses. And I think that there's been this very recent effort by the Council of Chairs of Training Councils to try to teach increased focus on social responsiveness as part of the curriculum. If people would like to take a look at that, uh, that's a free download from that particular website um, that uh, people can, uh, can uh, try to uh, look at and, and attempt to address. So now, 
before I begin, I, I have this set of questions and my thought was that um, um, uh, I would try to address each of these unless Pam, you would prefer to us sort of respond to each of them individually. But where do I come from in terms of the therapeutic work that I, I am involved in? Uh, there's a subset of the outpatient clinic at Boston Children's Hospital that I work in known as the Developmental Neuropsychiatry Clinic. It is the clinic where we see some of the most complicated and severely disturbed uh, youth. Um, this is the spot where we see early, uh, early uh, onset of psychosis, clinical risk for psychosis, youth with bipolar disorders, et cetera. So it tends to be at, at, at an extreme uh, as to what we would be doing. Initially, I, I thought about this as to, so what does this have to do with you know, thinking about violent extremism and, 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 and the beliefs that might be there. And point of fact is, the way I begin to approach this is in, in, in these particular issues and topics is similar to the way I try to approach most delusions and false beliefs that, that these particular patients may have. You know, if somebody is starting to evidence, you know, increased paranoid ideation, et cetera, and talking about walking down the street, happening to, happening to see a bus go by, and people are looking out the window and think that, that they're, they're being perceived as, as uh, potentially uh, dangerous people who might have bad intent towards them, and hence they want to not go walking on the street. That may be something that I need to specifically consider trying to address, all the way to you know, more extreme kinds of, of concerns and questions. For example, issues related to, gee, is there, you know, um, if, if somebody is, is of absolute belief that the police are evil and are out to get him uh, and, and are looking for resources to sort of support that kind of thinking, it's at that point in time that we would get uh, and try to get more, uh, more involved in that. So, um, you know, how do, how do I try to uh, decide when a belief, a belief has crossed into dangerous or harmful territory? I, I try to decide that in terms of what would be the imminent consequence of that um, for that person at that particular time. Is it something that I need to address immediately? Or is it that I'm going to be continuing to sort of build with, with that particular uh, uh, patient in my case, uh, sort of a relationship where I'm attending to other needs that they have actually identified. So it may very well be that I'm working with them on trying to improve some of their sleep hygiene. There may be major concerns about problems in performance in school. What about the interactions and relationships with family members? If I can be seen as a helpful person to them, in those particular contexts, it begins to set the stage for more, more global kinds of interventions that, uh, that I might consider. And at that point, I might then start to move into what uh, we would consider to be sort of more of a, a compassionate focused kind of uh, treatment. But, but these, these patients are used to my often asking them to systematically look at something that they've spoken about and addressed uh, at that point in time, and to then begin to, to evaluate it with me. And it's not so much that I am passing judgment on those particular evaluations, but trying to help them through sort of a, a Socratic way, a supportive Socratic way of, of talking about things, begin to sort of parse out what those kinds of concerns um, would, would look like. And, and um, and what is the evidence for them? And what's the importance of it for them yeah, to begin to think about at that, uh, at that time? Um, I tend to do more uh, extended treatment uh, sessions with people. So I have a bit of the luxury of time uh, to approach all of those things. And we, we'll return to these in a moment and when, when Pam has com uh, completed her discussion, but um, I really try to approach it as I approach all aspects of, of the, the treatment that I'm looking at, which has to do with can I enhance their curiosity with me and join me in their curiosity about that. Um, I may show respect for them in terms of the trying to, to better understand their beliefs. So if, if they're, if they're you know, reporting out that they think that the police hate them 
and that they, they want to sort of be provocative and respond back to them. I may, I may try to uh, speak with them about how, how they're feeling related to the police and then start to look at what's the evidence that the police are really out to get them and we can sort of try to uh, uh, tease that out a little bit more. And, uh, and then most importantly, how can I help you feel safer in a situation at this time, right now, immediately? What would matter to you? Uh, for me to, to try to address those sorts of things. So it's in those particular contexts that I would be in to work on that. Um, patients do have different worldviews oftentimes than, uh, than do, do I. And I think where it matters the most is if they were to consider acting upon or trying to get more involved in, in, uh, in groups that would potentially act upon um, uh, violent or, 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 or destructive um, uh, aspects of, of, uh, of life and what they would be doing. That's really where I would see major interventions needing to be undertaken. And it may very well be that I'm also including their families and significant others in, in terms of that kind of work. Um, uh, and uh, um, does, does this particularly this particular concern change with with age? I think that there I think that it was eloquently described, I think, in the previous panel that you know that the importance of, of um, with younger children monitoring what information they get, particularly in terms of the realm of of, uh, of, of the internet and monitoring, supervising, and, and volume of information becomes an important uh, component of that. As people enter into young adolescence, uh, there is the, certainly the realm of social, social media and its impact on them, particularly as they're developing their own sense of values, norms, and, and identities at that particular time. And that that would be addressed differently than with the uh, with a younger child in, in, in that situation. Um, and uh, uh, um, I, I do have the luxury, as I mentioned earlier, of looking at longer term therapeutic relationships and with people so that this does not necessarily occur now. So I think I'm gonna pause so I can make sure that Pam has, has time uh, to, to speak and uh, we can come back into this into and, and drill into it in greater detail as needed. Thank you, Jean, so much for those remarks, and then we have lots to discuss. Let me turn to Pam. Pam Tomorrow is the Director of Social Work at Boston Children's Hospital. She's a bilingual, bicultural clinician and leader with over 25 years of experience working in social welfare, community mental health, and healthcare settings. She has extensive experience in domestic violence programming, child protection, and responses to trauma and disasters. And when I reached out to her a year ago, she graciously agreed to supervise the clinical work on our Boston Children's Hospital Terrorism and Targeted Violence Prevention Team, where she has proven herself to be indispensable. So Pam, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this issue. Good morning or afternoon by this point. So I um, thank you for having me. I want to um, put it a little bit in context. Um, so uh, Jean was talking a lot about how do we approach this work from a longer term therapeutic intervention standpoint? And I think that's a really important difference here um, because the way that I think about these things actually tends to be a little bit more crisis inpatient, um, community postvention, child protection consultation, emergency department work. Um, that tends to be acute assessment and rapid response. And so you're looking at a situation with quite honestly, a very, very limited amount of information and trying to engage that situation as much as you possibly can. The ideal is that you have an abundant amount of information, um, but that's not always the case. And so the reality of the work is that it's often, you don't have the luxury of not addressing it. It's, it's upfront, it's there, it's on the plate and you are addressing it and you are approaching it with a level of compassion because everybody comes to the situation that is being presented in front of you. Um, with, uh, with a whole lot of information that you don't have. And so you have to assume as a clinician that you um, have to be compassionate in the context of 
uh, approaching it. And that means giving a lot of leeway so that you're not judging, you're not making those decisions too quickly. Um, you know, I'm a social worker, so we like to understand uh, systems approaches. We like to understand meeting, you know, being where that client is at that moment and trying to put ourselves in that situation and thoroughly understand it to help move it from one way to another. Um, and so we're looking at who is this kid, who is the, who are the adults around this kid? And, you know, again, we're a children's hospital, so we're really primarily working with children. So that's our context. But with kids become comes adults. And so you don't, you don't get away from the adult issues. Um, age, gender, demographics, family composition, developmental level, already assessed information if you're lucky, what else has already been looked at and how can I utilize that to help in that situation? Um, who are the current supports? What is the natural environment for this kid? We are a tertiary care environment at Children's Hospital. And we are not a natural environment for many, many of these kids that we're working with. And that's an important piece of it. What is the natural environment and how do we make sure that we're looking at those resources in their natural environments so that we, um, we can uh, resource it more. The reality of um, prevention is, is that it's often resource dependent. And so we, um, we're looking to try to bolster that everywhere, anywhere that we possibly can. Um, and then we're, under, we're trying to understand motivation and we're trying to understand means. What are the means to access to violence and, um, and what does that look like? Um, the ability to respond in a pediatric and an adolescent system is much more comprehensive than an adult response, right? Which is why I like working in a pediatric environment. Um, working in an adult environment is an incredibly difficult thing to do because the limitations are huge. You cannot do the same things that you can do in a pediatric environment, uh, in an adult environment that you do in a pediatric environment. Um, there is an incredible amount of availability of response structures. And the reality of that is that we see that um, because we see these kids that are embracing this extremism, what we know to be true is that there still isn't enough, no matter what. Um, and in an ideal world, what we always have is a number of different, uh, when we have a fire, we have a hose and we have a hydrant and in theory, a social worker or maybe a psychologist um, that is providing that level of support to that kid, but we're not often resourced uh, that well. And so what we're having to do um, is try to um, shoot the resources that we have at the fire and we know we're failing that miserably. And so that's all to say that our current systems are, are failing these kids, which is why we have many of the um, Many of the presentations that we have, they are uh, having to fight for the resources that um, are available. And um, if you don't have a, an adult that's there sitting next to you um, to get you there, to help with that, to be an advocate, to be a, um, a presence, then it becomes uh, tremendously difficult in order to be able to do that. Um, and, and what we're also trying to think about is um, what would, when we're looking at a kid, what would answering questions that we have or talking with us and building alliance and building a bond, what would that mean for that child? What, what did they have to gain from actually giving the information that I'm seeking? What is it that they um, could get out of it? And that's a really important question because the answer is often not a lot. Um, so the other thing I wanna just acknowledge is that, um, you know, in crisis versus long-term community engagement is essential, right? We can't do this work without community and you can't do this work without an invitation into that community. And that means that when you are um, uh, trying to uh, change the approach, so the question was how might your approach change in the context of the type of clinical encounter? If you're gonna be doing this work in um, a longer term capacity an invitation into a natural environment and that community is essential in order to be able to, to make gains in that. Um, crisis response is inherently not necessarily going to get you there because it is a punitive system. And so, um, and then the other thing I want to really acknowledge is that therapy is a privilege. So there was a comment about, you know, some kids that have a diagnosis and some kids that don't have a diagnosis. The reality is, is that being in therapy is a privilege for many, many, many of these children. And so um, they might not have, a, uh, they might not have an appropriate level of assessment to actually help us to understand what they're struggling with because they're not getting to those systems because the systems don't support that, right? So um, 
therapy is a privilege and many kids and many adults don't get to it because our systems don't support that. Um, and so what do you see as a risk of, of addressing um, mal, miss, or disinformation with a client? Um, what is the risk of not addressing it? Um, you know, therapeutic alliances and relationships are built from day one, which Jean talked about. And um, risk assessment is a thing, no matter what you do. If you're not working in a longer term therapy environment, which most kids are not, then you assess every single time. It is that it, it is in every engagement that you have with that child, you are assessing that, which means calling a child on whatever is presenting, talking with them in real talk, um, but at every single moment you're in that point of time, you're assessing what's happening because that's the reality of our, our, our systems, which don't allow us to uh, sort of sit back and expect that this child is gonna be held appropriately. Um, so in all of it, the answer is we are assessing uh, throughout every engagement that we have with a child or family. Um, and the intent to, to harm is implicit in dis and mal information, which means, um, uh, we, we do have to address if that's presenting in our therapies, in our engagements with kids, if there is um, dis and mal information that's present during those engagements, the intent to harm is uh, slight, it's implicit in that. And so let's figure out what that means. Like what is, uh, what is the actual extent or acuity that's presenting in that moment? Um, and ultimately, that means that clinicians really have to be comfortable in the uncomfortable and have a hard conversation no matter what we do. Um, and that is not actually what many, many people are good at. Clinicians are better at it, but generally all of the people that are around that kid, the clergy and the street workers and the youth workers and the um, teachers and the principals, all of those people have to have, be comfortable in the uncomfortable and asking those questions and engaging it. It has to be a systemic response. And we're terrible at that. We're terrible at being able to do that, to hold that, to feel comfortable as a, as a person to then ask these uncomfortable things. Um, and so we have to really increase those, um, that level of comfort um, and just acknowledge that it's going to be uncomfortable no matter what, but we still have to engage it. And that's the thing that we need to begin to teach everybody, right? Everybody, if we want to address systemic racism, if we want to address, you know, inequities, the reality is that those conversations are the only ways to do that. Um, and then do you think mental health professionals have a role to play in encountering? And, and yeah, absolutely. We totally need to be at the table. That's not an option. Mental health professionals need to be there and often leading the charge. Um, but we don't have a culture that really embraces mental health. So that's a, that's a disconnect and that's a piece of it that we're not necessarily um, uh, at that point of really being able to impact the systems. There are therapists, they're not enough therapists and, um, and people don't really wanna to talk to therapists um, because culturally it doesn't fit within the, the paradigm that's presenting for them. Um, and so that culture, needs to be built. We need to get to a different point. Um, I really appreciated the conversation we had. So I'm going to stop because I want to be able to answer questions and I want to be able to engage um, everybody. So thank you. Thank you both Pam and Jean. Wonderful. Totally appreciate your comments. I just want to note there, I was struck by a couple of things. One is how each of you in your own ways flagged this issue of um, Therapy is a privilege, and Jean, you talked about the enormous wait list right now for getting in treatment and the fact that our systems are, are failing, not just kids, but adults as well. Um, and so I think it's sometimes I, I've seen sort of an easy like, oh, well, a referral to a mental health professional is the solution here. And I just want to kind of surface the fact that it's not so easy. Um, there's a lot that goes into having that available and having an openness for an individual being willing to engage with that professional. Um, and so all of that needs to be true before we can even open this conversation of, and then how might you use that therapeutic moment, whether it's crisis intervention or longer term therapeutic relationship to address some of these um, sometimes very deeply held uh, beliefs and the structures around them, like the social bonds that are, might be keeping people in those beliefs. Um, so it was interesting to me that, that both of you flagged that. Another thing while I'm waiting for, and please start 
populating the chat with your questions or raise your hand um, while we're waiting some, for some of those to come in. I noticed another word that came up for each of you, compassionate. Um, and I wanted to share with you uh, a, boom, a conversation I had with someone who worked at our center that I've sort of struggled with, would love to hear your response. Um, we had received a referral for a kid who uh, was holding a lot of misinformation and hate against many different people. And this young staff member at one point, we were working very hard to figure out how to help this individual. And this young staff member turned to me and said, you know, this kid hates and would probably want to see dead every one of us in our center. And I looked around my Zoom screen and sure enough, we there because of being female or black or an immigrant or being Jewish, there was not a single person in my center who um, kind of wouldn't have been a target in some way of that individual's hate. And so it, I've been wondering since then, you know, how do we, we clearly need to have compassion in this work? And yet that can also be very challenging if it's, if some of the hate is directed against you or against your belief systems. And I'm wondering if either of you want to respond to how you do that, how you hold that compassion um, in the face of beliefs that might really undercut some of your own personal values. Um, just share your thoughts on that while I monitor some of the questions coming in. Want to jump in, Jean, go ahead. Um, I, I think some of it has to do with, for the, I think at that point in time, there is that, that feeling of while on the one hand, I could potentially be somebody who's being targeted by them um, um, for, for hate or whatever else, but I see that as very much a part of the, the problem that they have. And as long as I'm going to try to stay focused in on, on the problem uh, that they may particularly have, um, I feel as if I can continue to work with them and try to empathize with them, et cetera. It can be, I, I think they, you know, I, I would be the first, one of the first to acknowledge that working with people at times elicits very strong responses from people. I think I get most concerned uh, for myself if the response is, is, is indifferent, you know, that I'm not feeling something either really more positive towards and inclined towards a patient or, or is, is something in which I, I feel in some respects offended by, but at least I can sort of uh, try to, to it, it energizes me to move forward with it. And I would say that seems to be, 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 be the case. And the aspiration not to give up, I think that becomes the other component for me. Okay. Yeah, and I think that compassion for me has a lot to do with understanding where um, even though those, uh, to Jean's point, those emotions are elicited and, and it is hard to hear much of what you hear sitting with a client, what you are understanding at that point is it's coming from somewhere. What is the context? How am I using that context to help me understand where they might be coming from and how do I um, how do I then frame some level of intervention to engage that context in a way that they, that can be heard so that they are um, they are able to hear me so that it's not um, the two of us against each other, but it's about each other um, understanding that we're, we don't have to agree, but that we are compassionate with each other and um, and engaged in that moment to figure out where we're going to go with it. Right. Thank you. And another question that's come in, how might you suggest structuring a conversation with a person who is convinced of the veracity of some piece of mis mal or disinformation? A lot of that structure, I think, is about context. And so that's what I'm missing. It's hard to answer those questions without more of a level of context, um, because, you know, how much time do you have with them? Right. That's and how much um, what kind of engagement is it and um, and what is the context that you have? It's really about the, the whole picture of what's presenting. I know that's ideal, um, but that would help me to understand how to then um, uh, engage them in that piece of information and how to address that. Mine, mine tends to be a little bit longer relationships with people. Uh, and so it's usually in the 
in the context of um, what has their experience been with me to begin with? Have, have they been, you know, as a model in terms of, of therapy, in particular, when we get to things related to beliefs and motivations or interpretations of the world, um, I, I've had a, a particular process of trying to approach that with them, where I'm trying to, you know, increase their curiosity, both of it, I don't completely understand why you're thinking this way, so, and, but you know that I care about you, so let's try to connect and let's try to understand, help me understand this better as to what your thinking is as it relates to that. What evidence do you have related to it? What, what is it that you're grounded in? What are the emotions that are also fueling all of this? You know, if you're, if you're a frightened and very angry young person who thinks the world, you know, everyone in the world hates you um, and, and is using that then to find um, out some of the sort of very uh, radicalized groups um, to, to sort of embrace at least online, et cetera. You know, what purpose is that serving over and above the ideology and then moving into the ideology and trying to, to look at, um, at the, the misinformation that they may have uh, related to it. So it, it, from my way of thinking, it, there's not a quick fix to this stuff. It's very much a, a more endured process and it's one, one person at a time when we get into that. The other thing I wanted just to add to that is that, you know, we get to work with kids, which means that we get to be incredibly creative in our responses and how we're thinking about and moving things forward. And that includes, you know, the use of music, the use of um, dance and rhythm and the use of non-traditional means. Um, with many of these kids, you know, trauma sits on the verbal lexicon, so they can't actually articulate or talk really about what's presenting. And so, um, often working with kids or young adults, the, the more creative that you can be in that conversation, the more productive it is because it, it, it offers a medium for a level of comfort um, to not talk about the topic, but to talk about the topic. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two other questions. Uh, there was a question about um, individuals who are on the autistic spectrum and how your thinking of how you're working with them might change or you know, what are the implications there? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, uh, you know, I think um, it depends on the severity of what's presenting for me when we are, but I also, again, for every time with these kind of hard conversations or hard presentations, um, I'm coming back to engaging the family system in a, in a much more um, comprehensive way. How do we make sure that those family systems are part of these conversations so that you're not doing this work alone with, with this child? You're understanding the context and bringing that context into that relationship. Um, and then again, ensuring that you're resourcing it as much as you possibly can. Um, but it's but it's it's a thing. It's hard. It's hard to uh, engage a, a, a a kid that is um, that you know uh, is struggling already in the world. I I think also in, in that context of looking at as part of the assessment, you know, what are their their abilities and functions. So I'm often focused in on what are their social communication skills. How rigid is their thinking about anything? You know, if if. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to get after ideology um, and, and, and try to address that specifically that you may have if they are, you know, perseverative about what they're going to eat for food, you know, at any given meal, you know, and, uh, and so uh, trying to take that in the context of this is cognitive rigidity that I'm dealing with, and I'm going to try to work and address that in, in a variety of formats. It's not my problem. Um, or, or my, it's not my solution alone. It's going to be there, but it is the family context and maybe the school context as well uh, in terms of, of trying to address that. I do go back to, particularly with the autism spectrum youth, um, to be con concerned about, um, you know, their, their own sense of, of, uh, of potentially acting on a particular um, or worry or concern, you know, is there an increased thought about that I do need to, you know, to, um, to um, engage in some kind of uh, 
of, uh, of altercation with some people for any a variety of reasons that they may have, and just building in safety, um, uh, concerns with the families and things like that related to, uh, to all of that, particularly if there's a past history of some um, uh, uh, impulsivity that may be involved. Thank you so much. There's lots of fantastic questions coming through the chat, but I'm mindful of the fact that we're already at 101. Um, so, or at least East Coast time it is. So let me turn it over to Addie and say thank you so much to both Jean and Pam for sharing their thoughts and to all of you for your questions. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you again um, to everyone for um, all of our wonderful speakers today. Um, I am going to, here we go. Um, this was our last workshop um, that was actually, that's going to be regularly scheduled in this grant program. Um, however, we will be hosting a two-day virtual workshop um, or virtual fall symposium on December 7th and 8th. Um, we will have more information coming to you soon, including a save the date, so that way you can mark your calendars. Um, those workshops or those, that, those days for the fall symposium, they will only be um, two to three hours, so we promise not to take up too much of your day if you do choose to participate with us in those. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, if you have not done so already, if you could please fill out our membership um, requirement or our membership questionnaire. I'm going to send the link in the chat one more time. Um, if I can find it. Here we go. Um, go. Um, this is just a questionnaire that um, it should take less than five minutes and it's really giving us great insight onto how we can form this professional network to best benefit you. Um, and speaking of launching our network, um, we will also be preparing um, or we will also be convening our committees um, for the first time at the fall symposium again on December 7th and 8th. Um, and by completing this survey, you will have the opportunity to sign up for the various committees that are helping to evolve our network. Um, we are hard at work creating this virtual, virtual um, symposium that will allow for the network members to meet and converse with each other. This will be different than our average or than our typical two hour long topical workshops that we've been having since January and will provide a more robust opportunity to the network and other participants. Um, if you have any requests or suggestions on how we can make this the best um, possible, please let me know. Um, I will put my email in the chat. Um, and if I can have you all take our post poll, um, I will launch those questions right now. Um, again, if you have any ideas or have been to any fabulous um, virtual workshops or symposiums, conferences, et cetera, um, where you really feel like they nailed it, um, please do not hesitate to send uh, me an email with any of those ideas on how we can make this the best one yet. Um, also, additionally, we do post all of the recordings to this um, to our various workshops on our webpage, which you can find at McCainInstitute.org, um, and those go along with our various read ahead materials and practice guides. Right. 
Wonderful. Thank you all for sticking around and answering those questions. Um, hope you all have a lovely rest of your Friday and a wonderful weekend. Thank you.